If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We're in the book of Philippians today. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. Um, you can turn in your Bibles. You can swipe in your Bibles, what, whatever it takes to get there. Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Great to be with you all today. We're going to start in verse 7. If you're able to, stand with me this morning once you get to verse 7 of chapter 1. All right. The Bible says in verse 7, it is right, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection or compassion of Christ Jesus. Just like think about Think about the, the overtures of love that Paul has for this church. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ or the return of Jesus, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of God. Back to verse 8. <clears throat> for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And God's people said, Amen. Father, we bless your name for your word today. Thank you, God, that this is not just a history book. Um, thank you, God, that this is not an outdated book. God, it's your living word. Father, you have a word for us today, and we pray, Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Father, we're ready, and we're anticipating. And, and God, there are some of us who don't know what to expect, and we pray today, God, that our, our expectations would be exceeded. God, exceed gloriously our expectations and enable us to meet you today in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat today. <clears throat> in February 1941, there was a Franciscan priest. His name was Max Kobe. And, you know, this, this man had faithfully served God, and he was living uh, in Nazi Germany at the time. He was actually part of an underground movement that was shuttling Jews out of Germany, um, helping them escape the terrorism of the Nazi regime. And, uh, and as it was with most, most people who were uh, part of these underground movements, he was found out, he was captured, he was um, summarily sent to Auschwitz, which, you know, was one of the most notorious concentration camps, one of the most notorious death camps um, that was being facilitated during that time in Nazi Germany. Um, while he was there, there was a, you know, there was a prison escape that was attempted. It was a, a very daring prison escape. Um, it was ultimately thwarted by the SS. And the policy that the Nazis who oversaw Auschwitz had was, uh, was something like this. If you prisoners try to escape um, once that, once that es escape is thwarted, we will randomly select 10 of you, put you all in a room together, and let you starve to death over the course of time. This was just the reality of the horrors that were happening during World War II. Um, well, after this prison escape was thwarted, they did what they said that they were going to do. They selected 10 people, randomly selected 10 people, and one of the individuals that was selected, his name was Fran Gasovnicek. Um, as they pulled him out of the crowd, he began to plead for his life. Um, and he was pleading because he said he had a wife and he had children, and, and obviously he didn't want to die. And in that moment, Max Kolb, who was not part of the escape attempt, he stepped forward and he said, take me in his place. Take me in his place. And so... Um, the SS soldiers uh, put Gasovnicek back with the rest of the prisoners. They took Max uh, with the other nine, put them in a room, and ultimately, you know, they died of starvation over the course of time. 
NBC did a documentary on Gasovnicek's life and um, all of the horrors that he endured while he was in Auschwitz. Um, and he recounted the story with tears streaming down his face. And, and if you've seen the documentary, you know, he took the cameraman around uh, throughout his house and showed him all these different effects that he had from during that period of time. But he stopped specifically a one marble monument that had been tended every day with flowers and there was a placard in front of the monument that read, in memory of Max Kobe, he died in my place. And it was a powerful testimony, just a powerful testimony about a Christian man who was willing to live out the same love that Jesus had had for him. Because that's what that story is about. This man had been so transformed by the power of the love of Jesus Christ that he was willing to step in someone else's stead, step in someone else's place. And this individual had with him for the rest of his life the willingness, the, the understanding of the willingness of one individual to die so that he might live. Um, we may never have that opportunity as Christians. We ne may never be put in a situation that is so desperate and filled with so many horrors, but I will say to you, every day, we are given hundreds of opportunities to love like Jesus is loved. We're given hundreds of opportunities to lay our lives down sacrificially for other people. And you know, this really, I shared with you when we started this epistle, um, interestingly enough, this epistle is centered around a song, Philippians chapter two, verses five to 11. This was an early Christian hymn uh, that was sung as the people of God gathered together. And it is this beautiful description, explanation of the kenosis of Christ, the the willingness of Jesus to lay his life down sacrificially and then subsequently the exaltation of Jesus by the glory of God. And Paul wanted, Paul wanted so desperately for this small group of individuals, this church at Philippi, to really experience the transforming power of the gospel in their lives. Paul loved these people. As we read these verses, I'm certain that um, as you hear this like autobiographical piece of the Apostle Paul where he's talking about more than just a sentimental emotion that he had towards them, uh, more than just rational thoughts that he was thinking for them, because remember the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this epistle, he was under house arrest. He was chained 24 hours a day to Roman soldiers who were on a four-hour rotation and as he was bound, he was not lamenting his situation. He wasn't making accusations against God, which is sometimes what we do when we go through things that we don't like or things that, you know, we didn't expect would happen to us. Sometimes we make accusations against God. Paul wasn't doing that. He wasn't lamenting his situation. He wasn't downcast and discouraged and depressed. He wasn't turning inward. He was reflecting. He was thinking about the church at Philippi. He had this amazing love for them. Like I said, that, that extended beyond sentimental emotion and, and just, just random thoughts. He went so far as to say, you are in my heart. And I think what a, what a powerful way to express your love for somebody. And when he was in that place bound to these soldiers, he was inspired by the spirit of God, compelled to write to them because he wanted, like I said, this church to experience the, radi the radical transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted them to not only receive Christ's love, but he also wanted them to live his love out. And that's what kenosis is. You know, there's this interesting secret to Christianity. I, I kind of hesitate sometimes to use the word secret. Um, I can say it though, because sometimes you don't even hear it preached in churches today. There is this secret that if you want the joy-filled life, if you want a flourishing life, hey, how many people today gathered in the house of God want a joy-filled life? How many of you would say, yeah, man, I want that. I want a joy-filled life. I want a, I want a flourishing life. You know, you're, you want your life to be full of fruit for the glory of God? Well, listen, the pathway to get there is to follow in the steps of Jesus, and to empty yourself. That's what the word kenosis means. When the Bible says that Jesus emptied himself, it means Jesus chose not to exploit his divine power for his own purposes in retribution, exaltation, or self 
protection as the emperors of Rome were accustomed to do. Rather, he chose humility through the sacrificial way of the cross for love's sake. This was, I mean, he had all of this power. He was before Pilate and Pilate's like, don't you understand? I have the authority to crucify you. And Jesus said, paraphrase today, you ain't got nothing, boy. Okay. <laughs> it's like, you don't have any, you don't have any authority and power except that which has been given to you. And by the way, homie, okay, this is modern translation. <laughs> by the way, homie, if I wanted to call seven legions of angels to wipe you off the face of the earth, I could do it right now. But he chose not to. He chose not to. That's kenosis. He he restrained his divine power, didn't use it for his own purposes, retribution, exaltation, self-protection, as leaders in power so often do. Rather, he chose humility through the sacrificial way of the cross for love's sake. He did it because he loved the Father, He did it because he loved the Father and his his life was purposed to fulfill the will of the Father and he also did it because he loves you. I wanna just say maybe one of the most rhetorical things you hear on a Sunday morning at church, do you know God loves you? He loves, he loves you today, you know, in in all of your unloveliness. (laughs) You're like, I'm so offended. And all of your unloveliness and all of your failures and all your struggles and all of your inability to, f- to fulfill the law and the righteous expectation, God loves you and he loved you so much, he sent someone to do all that for you. His name is Jesus. That's good news today. And Paul, listen, Paul is, Paul is instructing this church that yeah, that is awesome that he's loved us like that, but you know, he set an example for us to follow, that we ought to love just as he loved. Um, Christians aren't often accused of being too loving, (laughs) right? I mean, when's the last time someone said to you, man, you Christians, you're all alike. It's just love, love, love with you guys all the time. (laughs) It's like, would you tone the love down a little bit? Well, that doesn't always happen. And sometimes, you know, it's because we're, we're falsely accused of not being loving. Sometimes because we don't tolerate or approve people's lifestyles or choices, we are, we are called unloving. And I'm going to explain to you in a minute why there are times where we don't tolerate or approve lifestyles or choices. But if we're being honest with each other today, sometimes the truth is this, sometimes we're just not loving. Sometimes we're not loving. Sometimes we're, we're just straight up grumpy. We're grumpy, difficult people who often say, well, you know what? I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And it's like, yeah, bro, like you've woke up on the wrong side of the bed for the last three years of your life. <laughs> you know, you can only use that so much. You can only use it so much. I get a week, I get a day, I get a week, you know? I mean, maybe you're having a bad month, but for like three or five years, I would say, try the other side of the bed. Like that's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my counsel to you today. Paul is gonna, he's gonna, he is gonna unload some radical content on them. But before Paul does that, check this out. What he does is he prays for them. He prays because he wants this content of the epistle to really impact their life. He's not giving them information just so that they can have a head full of knowledge. He wants them to be transformed. But Paul knew that God was the only one who can transform a heart to be ablaze with Christ's love. Paul knew that. And so, you know, Paul was a leader. Paul was a pastor. Paul understood because, you know, he taught the scripture, a lot to people that the volume of words doesn't transform or change a person's life. Paul had probably preached many times on Sunday at a gathering of God's people. And, you know, with people receiving solid biblical truth whose lives remained consistently unchanged. And Paul knew it wasn't a matter of his intellect. It wasn't a matter of his ability to argue somebody into understanding truth, Paul understood that only God was able to transform and change a heart. And if this church was gonna be set on fire with the love of God, it had to be a work of God himself. So I say that to say to you today, I've been praying for you. 
I've been praying for you. I've been praying for our church. That, that, that the content that's laid out in this book, you know, which is God-inspired, right, that this is the word of God for us would be received so that our lives could be transformed. Paul prays this theme of Philippians over their lives. I'm saying to you today that this epistle, before it even got to them, had been saturated in prayer because Paul really wanted their lives to be changed. As you look at this prayer today, which is going to be uh, our focal point, um, and by the way, let me say this. Some of you, some of you don't always know what to pray for people. You know, you ever have that situation in your life where you're, praying, you're, you're thinking about somebody, you really love somebody, and, and you know, you, you want to pray for them, and, and so you, you know, you, you, start, you start your prayer out, and it's like, God, I love Mike. Just love that guy. And uh, I pray that you bless Mike's life. And then it's like dot, 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 <laughs> dot, because, because you're not necessarily sure what to pray for Mike. And you know you're wise enough not to just pray your opinion because you want God to hear in heaven and answer on earth. And if you're just going to pray your opinion, if you're just going to pray your criticisms, if you're just going to pray your perspective on Mike's life, you know you run the risk of having nothing answered because you and I are called to pray according to the will of God. And when you and I pray according to the will of God, that, that's what in Jesus' name means. So hey, by the way, Jesus, in Jesus' name, is not, it's not like, hey, 10-4, good buddy, over and out. It's like, hey, you pray whatever you want. You got your opinions. You got your criticisms. You got your ideas. And everyone's all messed up. And you got it right. And you prayed this whole prayer to God. And you're like, in Jesus' name. Like, somehow, postscripting your prayer or punctuating it within Jesus' name makes everything that you said good to go and God's going to do something. No, no, in Jesus' name means that you're praying according to the will of the Father. And, and so, listen, if you don't know, this is, this is the point. I'm taking the long way of getting there. If you don't know what to pray for somebody, go to the prayers in the Bible and, and let the prayers of Scripture navigate you. Let them be a guide. Um, I'm not saying to you today, pray them by rote. I'm saying to you that they will be a guide so that you are sure you are praying the will of God in someone's life. Paul is laying out this uh, beautiful prayer, um, and there's a trajectory of this prayer. I want to just give you a couple of pictures today. These aren't random, arbitrary ideas that Paul is praying um, about that are disconnected. They are connected together. He's praying three things for these people. Say the word three today. Three. He's praying three things. Can you pray for three things? He's praying three things for people. These are like three links in a chain. They're connected together. They're inseparable. Um, another illustration is if you, know, you picture a pyramid, they're like three layers in a pyramid. There's going to be a foundation, uh, a middle layer, and then the pinnacle, the top. Paul is praying fundamentally for the foundation of love in the lives of these believers. Paul is then praying that they would love the right way um, because you know you can love the wrong way. There's a right way to love, and there's a wrong way to love. And then Paul gets to the very pinnacle of that, um, and it's how loving as a foundation the right way prepares you for the coming of Jesus and also to have a fruitful life. So check out verse 8 with me. <clears throat> for God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love, that your love, Paul could have prayed for health, he could have prayed for wealth. He could have prayed for prosperity. He could have prayed for protection and persecution. Now, now listen, I'm not saying that those things are necessarily wrong to pray, but Paul had a higher priority. Paul is praying for their love. Some of you are uh, baby boomers or Gen Xers. You remember, you remember Tina Turner? She sang a song called, Darn right, I love you guys. Uh, this, is, this is my favorite service. <laughs> Don't tell the first service. <clears throat> she sang a song called, What's Love Got to Do With It? Right? And now that's stuck in your mind, and you'll probably not remember anything else that I taught today. <clears throat> but the answer to that question is everything. 
For the Christian, the answer to that question is everything. It is all about love. The lawyer came to Jesus, trying to trip him up, said, hey, what is, Master Rabbi, what is the greatest of all the commandments, of all the 613 commandments in Torah, um, and even including the 10 that were given on the top of Mount Sinai, which one is the greatest of all of them? And you remember, Jesus said, hey, listen, there are two that if you get these two right, it fulfills the rest of them. If you get these two right, you get them all right. Can you imagine going into a class and the teacher saying, hey, there's a hundred questions on this test, but if you get these two questions right, you get the whole test right. You would make sure that you answered those questions right. Um, If you're gonna go buy a car and you're taking a loan and Bank of America says to you, hey, 72 payments, 72 installments. But if you get these two payments and installments right, the rest of the car is paid for. You're like, sign me up for that right now. Where, where's, that, where's that deal? And essentially, Jesus is saying, in these two commandments, all, it, all of the others are encapsulated. You get these two right, you get it all right. The first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, What I love about what Jesus is saying is God has made it clear. God has made it clear. I know you've had people in your life that you've had relationship with, um, and they've been really difficult. It's been really hard to figure out how they want to be loved. And, you know, sometimes for those complex people, it's like, you know, what book can I read to help me know how to love this person. And so you get books like The Five Love Languages, which is, gives you a description on how some people perceive and receive love. Some people just make it really hard. Like it's an enigma to figure out what love really means to them. God's not that way. God's made it clear. God, God is essentially saying through his son, hey, this is what I want. Number one, I want you to love me with everything. I want you to love me with everything. I want you to love me with all that you are, all of your heart, all of your intellect and mind, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your physical body, all of you needs to be invested, the whole you, the whole you, we compartmentalize in the West. And so sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, God got a part of me, and since he got a part of me, he should be happy with me, and God's like, I don't want just a part, I want the whole, I want the whole you. And by the way, you know, it's not presented as a suggestion, this is a commandment Which is the greatest of all commands? Well, the first is to love the Lord your God with everything. Jesus didn't say, well, here's a suggestion. And if you feel like it, you know, if your life is going really good, if, 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 you know, you're in that place where it's like, well, well, you're ready to do this because it all is oriented around you anyway. That's not what he says. Not a suggestion, not an option. Command number one is to love the Lord your God. By the way, let me also say, which God are we talking about? This is a really important question to answer. Which God are, God are we talking about? We're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have to be specific on this because people can say, hey, listen, I love God. And it's like, well, which God do you love? And it's like, oh, you know, I kind of made him up. I got, I got a little mixture, man, pastor, isn't that awesome? I got a little new age, I got a little Buddhism, I got a little Islam, I mixed in a little Christianity, and it's like, bro, you've been watching Oprah? Is that what you've been doing? <laughs> because, because, because that's the God of Oprah, that's not the God of the Bible. You're like, don't pick on Oprah. <laughs> so, and he said, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself to love your neighbor as yourself. Now the lawyer, like every good lawyer, no offense to lawyers here today, um, he's looking for a loophole, so he's like, well, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus, Jesus gives a, a parable, right? He's, he's like, there was a certain man. He's just, he's so cool, right? He gives this beautiful parable of the, of the individual, the good Samaritan who was willing to help somebody who was in need. And the moral of that story, back to the lawyer, is everyone is your neighbor especially those around you who are in need. And so Jesus says uh, to the lawyer, love the Lord your God with everything you got, love your neighbor no less than you love yourself. Augustine called this the order of loves, and your love must be ordered. 
First order of love is receiving God's love and choosing to love God. Some of you have never taken that step of faith. There are some of you here today who have never really received the love of God through Jesus Christ. Maybe your mindset about Christianity is never even, you've not put the love of God in the framework of your understanding of the Christian faith. And let me tell you today, the Christian faith is all about the love of God. First order of love is to receive God's love and to love him. Second order is to love others in your family, amongst your friends, in your community, even strangers, neighbors. These are the fundamentals. Every good athlete, maybe you're gonna watch the, the US Open, it might be over, I'm not sure, don't check on your phone right now, but <laughs> you watch the US Open, you see some amazing tennis players, or you watch, since it's day number one of the NFL. I just wanna commend you guys for being at church today, all right? <laughs> This is, this is a really good sign. But you know, uh, athletes that excel in their craft, they know the fundamentals. Brothers and sisters, we need to know the fundamental, fundamentals. Love is supreme for the Christian. There's no loophole, there's no clause. This is what we do. First Corinthians 13 says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is the single most important thing. The second layer or the second link is this. Paul prays for them that they're going to love right. In fact, he says this, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So before he gets into knowledge and discernment, he's like, hey, your love, by the way, is an action. It should be active in your life. And my prayer is that it is overflowing. But the terminology he uses here is excessive. It's the idea of a cup being filled with water and then continuously being filled so that it is pouring over onto the table and then onto the floor. In other words, as Christians, as we walk with Jesus, our love ought to be growing, not declining. We should be able to look at our lives. Maybe you've walked with Jesus for a year or for a month or for five years or 10 years or 15 years. You should be able to say today, I am more loving today than on the first day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Paul is saying your love should be constantly growing. It should be constantly growing. It shouldn't be stagnant. It should go up, not down. It should be focused outward, not inward because living things grow and dead things plateau and die. Love for us is like a muscle that is either exercised or atrophies. And there's a right way to love and there's a wrong way to love. I want you to consider this quote today. It's really important and kind of the central point of today's message. The capacity to love, the capacity to love is a gift entrusted to you by God that he expects you to exercise according to his will. The capacity to love is a gift entrusted to you by God that he expects you to exercise according to his will. So Paul is like, listen, you've got to have the foundation of love in your life. You understand this is incontrovertible. Love is supreme for the Christian. And not only that, but your love should be growing. It should be um, developing. It should abound more and more, and it should abound more and more with knowledge. The Greek word for knowledge here is epignosis. Uh, This is more than just intellectual knowledge. This is a knowledge that comes by experiencing God in truth. This is a knowledge that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, In other words, what Paul is saying is, as you are in a relationship with the Father through the Son, what happens is you grow, and you grow closer to God, And you understand who God is on a greater level day by day. And as that happens, God is not only sourcing your love, but he is shaping your love to reflect him more on a daily basis. The the metaphor that Jesus gave uh, was the picture of of a vineyard where the father is the husbandman. He's the one who oversees the vineyard. Jesus, the son of God, is the vine 
And Christians individually are the branches that are connected to the vine. In John 15, Jesus is essentially saying, hey, your relationship with me and with the Father looks something like this. You know how a branch is connected to a vine, the vine is connected to the soil, and the husbandman, the the vine dresser, oversees the orchard. Well, the branch is so intertwined with the vine that it's receiving all of its nutrients, all of the water, um, all of the uh, essential elements necessary for life come only through the vine. And as the vine and the branch are interconnected and there's this interchange of resources, that branch ultimately bears forth fruit. There's clusters of grapes that grow because there is a relationship between the vine and the branch. And I think that Paul is praying that very thing for these Christians. He's saying, hey, I'm praying that your relationship with the Father through the Son is so deeply interconnected that the Father would be continuously feeding you, that you would be continuously growing, that you would understand him more on a consistent basis, and as you do, your love would be fashioned in such a way that all you do would be for his glory. Paul is saying the Father sources uh, love to you, He's certainly saying, hey, that type of love doesn't come from ourselves. We're not manufacturing it, um, and it's shaped by him as well. So listen, in your relationship with God, this is how it ought to look. And listen, I understand that we um, we have successes and failures as Christians, but on a continual basis, God is revealing more and more of himself to us. And as that Revelation is progressive. We have the opportunity to radiate him more clearly to the world around us. That's what it means to have our love grow with knowledge. He says not only knowledge, though, he also says discernment. And so as we grow in our relationship with God, we know as we look at the life of Christ what love is supposed to look like, and we also know what love is not supposed to look like. So let me say to you, let me remind you today, as a Christian, you can no longer love whatever you want to. As a Christian, you can no longer love whatever you want to. Um, That's what got you in trouble in the first place, was living a life where you were loving all the wrong things. And you know, sometimes, you know, as we're living our lives radiating the love of God, some people will say this, well, love comes from God, and, and, you know, because love co- comes from God, all love is good. And so if, if all love comes from God and all love is good, then God must be okay with all kinds of love. And the answer to that is not according to the Bible. Because when you're loving something that God doesn't want you to love, it's sin. When you're loving something that God doesn't want you to love, it's sin. When you were flying upside down and you weren't a Christian, um, probably a lot like me, you were loving all sorts of things that sent Jesus to the cross. The problem with the world around us is that people think that they can love whatever whatever they want to. And the problem with that is if you love the wrong thing, it's sin or idolatry. Let me just say, this is what you would expect the non-Christian to do. You would expect the non-Christian to love things that are displeasing to God because they're flying their lives upside down. But when we meet Jesus Christ, our life turns right side up and we realize, hey, I can't love stealing. I can't love lying. I can't love sex or romantic relationships outside of God's prescription. I can't love money. I can't love gluttony. I can't love gossip. I can't love slander. I can't love pride. I can no longer love those things that God hates. Now, you might be saying today, well, are you saying then that God hates sinners? No, I'm saying God hates sin, but God loves the sinner. This is why just because you don't accept what people love doesn't mean that you don't love them. As Christians, we're able to say, hey, you were made for so much more. You were made for so much more. As Christians, we can approve what's excellent because we understand the purpose that God has for every single individual fundamentally to be connected to him in a relationship and to bear his image. 
And so we can lovingly come to them and say, hey, you know, you were made for so much more. That thing that you're loving right now, it's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to meet your needs. It's gonna, not going to make you better. It's not going to lead you to healthy relationships. It's not going to enable you to, to have a flourishing relationship with your husband or your wife. It's not going to be or provide a, an atmosphere where your children are going to grow up healthy and whole. You've been loving all the wrong things. But let me tell you this, what you need to love is you need to love God. You need to love God. Because, because when you discover, when you discover the love of God, he transforms and changes your life. He satisfies the deepest needs that are within you. He fills your cup to overflowing with his love so that you can love other people with his love and not your own conditional, someone say the word conditional today. Not your own conditional love that's built on a series of expectations that you have for people around you that they will never be able to fulfill and that you can't fulfill yourself. The love of God will transform and change your life. This is how we as Christians approve what is excellent. So as we grow, this is what Paul is saying. Fundamentally, you have a foundation in love. You need to learn to love the right things. You're maturing as believers. You're growing in your relationship with God. You understand God. He's not only sourcing your love, he's shaping your love. You're approving what is excellent in the eyes of God and you're disapproving what keeps people from having a relationship with God. And the third link in the chain is you do all this so you're ready. You do all this so you're ready. He says in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The third link, the third layer is this. Paul's like, I'm praying for you, that you understand the love of Jesus, that it transforms your life, that you're filled to overflowing with this foundation of love, loving right, so that when Jesus comes back, so when Jesus, hey, hey brothers and sisters, church, people get ready. People get ready, Jesus is coming. And Paul's like, Paul is a good pastor. He's like, hey, when he shows up, I want you to be pure and blameless. As a good pastor that cares for this flock, he's saying, I want you to be sincere and without offense. I don't want you to be in a place, in other words, where you're concealing and, and covering up and hiding that word sincere, the Latin word sincera, uh, was used when potters, if they broke their pot, I'm not talking about 21st century <laughs> pot today, I'm talking about that kind of pot. If they broke their pot, they're like, hey, I don't wanna make another pot and I don't wanna lose the money on this. And so they would take the shards and then they would put it all back together, connected with wax. Well, you guys know the problem. If that, you, you go and you buy it, and hey, hey this is a, a pretty good looking pot. And so you go, you take it home, you fill it with water, you set it out in the sun. Well, you know that wax melts in the heat of the day. And so pretty soon, not only do you discover that you bought a cracked pot, but you're, <laughs> we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> but it's springing leaks is springing leaks when the heat is on. And Paul is just simply saying, look, love is the answer. Sincere, genuine, authentic love for God and for other people is gonna protect you from concealing your faults. It's gonna protect you from covering up the impurities and acting like they're not there. It is gonna keep you from living a life of hypocrisy where you say you are one thing out in public and yet you are something completely different in private. It's gonna keep you from airbrushing your life on social media. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Because we, we, all, we all can, and this is not anti-social media, but we, but we can all present our, our, our best self now. Right, we can, we can not only by a little airbrush, but a little AI. It's like, I didn't know pastor had that much hair. Well, <laughs> pastor don't have that much hair. He just, he just plugged a picture into chat GPT and, and you know, picked the right prompt. And this is what Paul is saying. Hey, when he comes back, when he comes back and the glory of his light is shining, I don't want you springing leaks. I don't want, uh, because we're all crackpots. 
And, and Paul certainly is not saying, hey, you guys, you better be perfect. You better like dial it in um, because if you're not perfect, when he comes back, you'll probably get rejected. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, be honest, be real. Don't, don't cover it up. Um, don't be in a place where you're just praying, God, change me, God, change me, God, change me. You know, and you're not, you're not actively saying, God, I need you to change me. I need you to help me. I'm going to take steps for change. Because you can pray, God, change me 40 years in your life and never experience change. And God the whole time is saying, hey, hey why don't you, I've, I've, I've given you everything, Christian. I've given you my spirit. I've given you my word. I've given you the community of God's people. You have everything necessary. Now get after it and be honest. Hey, fellas, come on Tuesday night so we can all be honest about how we are crackpots in need of Jesus and how we can support each other mutually in our growth. Because some, sometimes it's like, man, if I go to that, if I go on Tuesday night, they're going to find out that I'm not perfect. <laughs> Paul is saying, I want you to be ready. Paul is saying, not only prepared, I want you to be productive. I want you to be productive. When you get to heaven, I don't want you just getting in by the skin of your teeth. I don't want you getting up with nothing to getting up there with nothing to give. I want you to have a life that is filled to overflowing with the fruit of righteousness. That you have been able to discern as you've grown in your knowledge of God and his love, those things that please him. And because you have been investing in what pleases God, there is an abundance of fruit. And you will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Like faithful because you did what God directed you to, to do. Good because you chose the right thing. When you live on this earth to please God, when you get to heaven, he will be exalted by all of the fruit that you have worked to earn on his behalf. This is why Paul said, whether we're here or whether we're there, we make it our aim to please the Lord. John 15, 7 says, John 15, 7, just wrapping up. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you shall be my disciples. 